Hello, my name is Evelyn, and I recently turned 32. I am employed at an international investment company, which focuses on foreign markets. My husband, Brian, works in the service sector. However, his job security is precarious as his contract renews annually. This lack of stability brings a sense of unease each year as renewal time approaches. Brian comes from a family that holds government positions in high esteem. Both his parents were government employees, and his sister currently holds a government job. Unfortunately, they view my role in the private sector with a certain disdain. Since marrying Brian, we have lived with his family, who have openly criticized my employment at a company that primarily aims to generate profit and compensate its staff. There's a prevailing notion among some that individuals in private companies are there because they failed to secure government jobs. This belief extends to the assumption that working for a foreign company is often a last resort, a fallback when local opportunities fall through. Brian, influenced by his family's beliefs, clings to his job despite its temporary nature because it affords him a certain level of societal standing and income. Once, during a particularly anxious moment about his job security, I asked Brian whether a permanent position in a regular company might be safer than his temporary government role, especially as the fiscal year wound down. He responded quickly, suggesting that if he couldn't be a civil servant, he'd rather not work at all. It appears he hasn't even disclosed to his parents that his role is not permanent insisting that I keep this a secret. Additionally, Brian, perhaps in keeping with his British upbringing, often boasts about non-existent promotions, a facade I struggle to comprehend. This situation leaves us navigating a complex web of family expectations, job insecurity, and the challenges of living with values that deeply contrast with our reality. Brian maintains a facade for his family, striving to appear successful and stable in his career. He keeps the details of his finances rather private, rarely sharing his salary statements with me. Instead, only modest sums are transferred into our joint account. Curious about his earnings, I once inquired during a family gathering. Brian is a section manager now. Surely his salary has seen a boost. How much does he earn now? He responded tersely with just six words. You can earn so much these days. While I know I earn well as a bond trader, largely through commissions and consistent profits, I wasn't sure how my income stacked up against a government section chief's salary. My role has me earning substantially, often more than many other corporate employees. When Brian hinted at the amount I make, my mother-in-law seemed impressed, but admitted she couldn't gauge it against the earnings from her era. It seems Brian is doing well, she commented proudly. His sister, a city office employee, overheard our conversation and chimed in, hinting that if Brian were in her position, he might have been a division head by now. Government jobs do pay well, don't they? She remarked. Witnessing the reactions, Brian appeared increasingly uncomfortable, regretting he had brought up my salary at all. He quickly diverted the conversation. Let's not talk about salaries anymore. By the way, did anyone meet with the housing company representative who visited recently? Are we considering renovations for this house? Indeed, a sales rep from a housing company had visited, and sensing Brian's need to switch topics, I played along discussing potential home improvements. As for the kitchen remodeling, we were thinking, I began, only to be sharply interrupted by my mother-in-law who exclaimed, stay out of family matters. You're just a daughter-in-law. Keep quiet and do as you're told. Her glare was piercing, almost fearful. It was clear she remained perpetually dissatisfied with anything I contributed to the conversation. The root of my mother-in-law's dissatisfaction seems to stem from the fact that I'm not employed by the government, a prestigious occupation in her eyes. Adding to her grievances is her perception of how I handle our finances. She believes that I control all of my husband Brian's earnings and dictate how much he can spend by giving him an allowance. In reality, though, Brian's salary primarily covers his personal expenses, 
and the majority of our household costs are funded by my income from working at a foreign investment firm. My sister-in-law, who lives with us as well, does not contribute financially to the household. She often makes remarks that hint at her belief that we are financially comfortable and don't need her help. You're taking money from an elderly couple who only have their pension, and Brian earns a lot, so you're not struggling, right? She says, not showing any willingness to assist with expenses. Living in my husband's family home does save us from the burden of rent, allowing us to get by on my salary alone, but it does create a palpably tense atmosphere. After dinner, as discussions about possibly working with a housing company arose, I found myself excluded and chose instead to busy myself by cleaning up the kitchen. Neither my mother-in-law nor my sister-in-law lifted a finger to help with the chores. After cleaning, I quickly returned to the routine of cooking, cleaning, and laundry, tasks I undertake daily without respite. One of the benefits of my job at the foreign company is the absence of required overtime. As long as I complete my tasks efficiently during regular hours, I'm free to leave on time, which is immensely relieving. This arrangement allows me to maintain a clear boundary between my work and personal life, ensuring I don't have to carry job-related stress into our home, a significant advantage indeed. On his days off, Brian often stays busy with his computer at home. I sometimes worry about whether it's appropriate for him to bring work home and continue there. When I expressed my concern, he simply explained, I can't work overtime and if I don't finish on time. His response trailed off, leaving unresolved questions about balancing our work life and personal tensions in our already strained household. Lately, the atmosphere at home has become increasingly strained. My husband Brian has been irritable and quick to anger, particularly when I attempt to discuss any matters with him. Recently, when I brought up a topic about our housing, he snapped at me saying, It's none of your business. Didn't mom tell you that already? Just follow the rules. That's all you need to do. Despite my efforts in managing both the household chores and our finances, his approach of keeping me excluded from certain discussions leaves me feeling sidelined and undervalued. One day, a representative from a home building company visited my in-laws residence. Everyone, except for me, gathered around a computer to discuss floor plans and view housing designs. Curious, I approached to see what was being planned over a cup of tea, but was sharply rebuked with a, you don't need to see this go away. I was taken aback to discover that instead of merely renovating, they were planning to build an entirely new house. My father-in-law had mentioned wanting more space since our current home was feeling cramped, and it seems they are moving forward with these plans. My in-laws, both retired from government jobs, have amassed a considerable sum from their pensions. Since I moved in, they have been living off this pension without contributing to daily living expenses so they likely have a significant amount saved for this new construction. Choosing to distance myself from the ongoing housing discussions, I can't help but worry about future arrangements, especially concerning my sister-in-law who is 29 and might soon decide to marry. I wonder if she plans to reside in this new house as well, which could further complicate our already delicate family dynamics. Although there hasn't been an explicit discussion about it, I'm assuming my sister-in-law will be residing in the new house. My feelings toward her mirror those I hold for my mother-in-law. Neither is particularly helpful with household chores, and both are often found complaining. I find myself silently hoping she will marry soon and perhaps move out. However, during a conversation with the home builder, my father-in-law expressed a desire for the new house to accommodate multiple families. Can we add another room? I want a house where my daughter and her future husband, my son, and us can all live together, he said. This revelation was unexpected, especially since it hinted at a future where my sister-in-law's potential husband might also join us under the same roof. Shockingly, there was no mention of it being my and Brian's family home, just Brian. It felt like I was being excluded from plans. 
The proposed house is slated to be large, yet fitting four households on the current site will undoubtedly be tight. While my in-laws and sister-in-law seem to be spearheading the building project, I find myself without a voice in the matter. I anticipate that maintaining such a large home will be quite a challenge. Later, when the home builder and my family went out to review the model room and construction site, my mother-in-law curtly told me, stay out of this, it's none of your business. Her words were spiteful and she looked almost disappointed when I didn't retort. The plans for the new housing are progressing, and while I'm kept in the dark, the rest of the family is preparing for the move. Seeing my husband inactive and disengaged, I questioned him, Aren't you going to help with the move? His response was abrupt and tinged with annoyance. Why should I? Aren't you the one handling it? This confused me even further. Why was he angry when I was merely trying to understand our plans? especially when I felt so out of the loop about when and where we were moving. As time went on, and whenever I found a moment, I began to prepare for the move in whatever ways I could, still puzzled and frustrated by the lack of communication and the apparent expectations placed upon me. As the days drew closer to the mysterious moving day, I methodically packed our belongings, keeping mine separate from my husband's, my patience with my mother-in-law's hostile demeanor was waning, and I harbored growing suspicions about my husband's secretive discussions concerning the new house. Out of sheer necessity, I asked him, When are we moving? His response was dismissive and curt. Just get ready, you don't need to know, that's it. From snippets of overheard mealtime conversations, it seemed the move was imminent, Yet, oddly, no one deemed it necessary to inform me directly. It was as if they viewed me merely as a temporary housemate, not a family member. The reality of our situation abruptly became clear when the movers showed up unannounced while I was cleaning up after breakfast. Leave them. We'll buy new ones, my mother-in-law said nonchalantly, then added, By the way, do you plan to move into the new house with us? Her tone was probing, almost taunting, and in that moment, I realized that they had been deliberately excluding me from discussions about the new house and had been secretive about the moving day as part of a calculated plan to oust me from the family home. My husband, standing silently behind my mother-in-law, laughed along but said nothing, indicating his probable agreement with their scheme. I had anticipated something like this might happen, which is why I had packed my things separately. Now, faced directly with their animosity, my mother-in-law coldly declared, From now on, only the family will live here. Do as you wish. My sister-in-law, who looked genuinely worried, probably thought I would beg to join them, tearfully pleading my case. Not satisfied with my calm demeanor, my mother-in-law snapped harshly, Anyone who relies on someone else's earnings should leave now. Brian will build the new house and pay off the loan with his salary. We don't need a freeloader. Her words were laced with anger, but ironically, I was the one who had been planning to leave all along. When I discovered that the financial plan for the new house hinged on my husband Brian repaying the mortgage with his salary, I nearly laughed aloud. It was clear from his expression that he had been left out of the loop. His surprise was palpable as he found himself unable to challenge his visibly irate mother and chose silence instead. His parents seemed convinced that they could preserve their retirement funds, placing the burden of the new home's financial obligations squarely on Brian's shoulders. This revelation only solidified my decision, and I shared my plans with a calm smile. Got it. I've decided to proceed with divorcing Brian. The news didn't sit well with my mother-in-law, who erupted in shouts. However, my father-in-law and sister-in-law intervened, pulling her away and leaving Brian and me alone in the old house. With the new house address in hand, reluctantly given by Brian after I insisted, I would need it to send the divorce papers. I prepared for my departure. A friend assisted me in moving my few belongings. Before leaving, 
I took a final step to separate our intertwined lives. I transferred all public utility bills from my in-law's house into Brian's name. Returning to my parents' home gave me a temporary respite to regroup. Once settled, I visited the impressive new four-family home where Brian and his family had moved. Upon arriving, my mother-in-law immediately confronted me, her tone sharp and unwelcoming. Ignoring her outburst, I approached Brian, divorce papers in hand, and requested his signature. As we stood there, about to finalize the end of our chapter together, my mother-in-law turned to him, likely to intervene or express her disapproval once more. As I stood in the grandiose new home my in-laws had moved into, my mother-in-law, unable to contain her scorn, mocked me in a sarcastic tone, useless wife, it's because she's not a government worker, hurry up and say it. Facing her directly, I couldn't help but retort with a touch of irony myself. What a splendid house. Are you sure you can manage it on Brian's salary? Her face flushed with anger as she sharply told me, You're the outsider now, so don't concern yourself with us. Take the divorce papers and leave. I took a moment longer to observe my husband's pale, shocked expression, a silent testament to the gravity of our situation. With the divorce papers in hand, I promptly left their house, my mother-in-law's furious gaze following me out. I headed straight to the town hall to submit the divorce documents, determined to leave that chapter behind and start anew. Feeling drained from the tumult of married life, I decided to live alone, settling into a small apartment close to my work. This new space was just what I needed, free from the constant disputes and the exhausting expectations to uphold a household single-handedly. Life became significantly more peaceful without roommates boasting about government employment or shirking household responsibilities. Just as I was beginning to enjoy my newfound tranquility and put thoughts of my husband behind me, an unexpected call disrupted the calm. An unfamiliar number appeared on my phone. It was Brian, using a friend's phone. His voice cracked as he pleaded, I can't pay the loan, Evelyn. Will you come back to me? I can't afford the mortgage, electricity, water bills, or even my phone bill. Assuming he could turn to his family for support, I replied, Your sister has a stable job and your parents are retired with pensions. They should have some savings, right? Dismissing his plea, I was prepared for him to reach out to them. However, my ex-husband then reluctantly confessed revealing more about his desperate situation. As I listened to my husband on the phone, it became painfully clear that his family's financial stability was a facade. Their retirement savings had been devastated by an investment scam, and his sister had accumulated considerable debt through excessive use of credit cards. This once proud family of civil servants, who had always portrayed themselves as financially prudent, was now revealed to be in dire straits. Their struggles became apparent after moving to a new house, which seemed to have stretched their finances to the breaking point. In desperation, they reached out to me, hoping for support or perhaps a reconciliation, but I had no desire to re-engage with them. I firmly declined their request and ended the conversation. Despite repeated calls, I maintained my distance, letting the phone ring unanswered until they finally stopped trying to contact me. Curiosity led me back to their neighborhood sometime later, where I was greeted by the sight of a for sale sign outside their recently acquired home. I spoke with a representative from the housing company who happened to be there and learned that my in-laws had sold the house shortly after it was built due to their inability to manage the mortgage. It was revealed that a relative had co-signed the loan and now faced financial difficulties because of this obligation. This was the same family that had once boasted about their secure government jobs and disparaged those in the private sector, including a relative who worked in a private company and had become their co-signer. The family's financial collapse and the subsequent sale of the house had led to tensions and even ostracism from other relatives. 
It seemed that their previous pretensions of stability and their slight regard for those outside the civil service were now backfiring spectacularly. As I settled into my sofa at home, the irony of the situation struck me. I couldn't help but chuckle at the thought of my ex-husband and his family, who had once taken pride in their government status, now viewed as burdens by their relatives. They no longer had anyone to impress with tales of bureaucratic importance, and instead, they had become a cautionary tale of financial mismanagement and misplaced pride. The absurdity of their predicament was a stark contrast to the quiet contentment of my own simpler, more genuine lifestyle 